Hi everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful weekend. Um, and I hopefully <coughs> got your exams <coughs> turned into okay. <laughs> Admittedly, I've not even looked at them yet. That will be on uh, my list of things to do early this week. I'm scared to look at the syllabus to figure out when the next quiz is going to happen because this class goes by so fast. Anyway, um, let me think. I think that was all the administrative stuff I wanted to tell you. So we're going to dive in now and talk about the origins of life, okay? And so it's kind of hard to think about this overall because when we think of life, we think of it as fully functional. So made up of cells and, you know, response to environmental stimuli and all sorts of other good stuff. But we have to figure out, like, how did the different parts of cells come together, okay? And so that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, for today. And I'm also going to have you guys watch this awesome video that will probably change how you think about how we define life. And that's kind of the purpose of it because it's really, really cool. So approximately 13 billion years ago, we had what was known as the Big Bang. And this is when our universe was actually formed. And so eventually what would happen is for the Earth, we have a whole bunch of gases that would come swirling around and swirling around. And finally, the force of gravity would kick in and start to pull everything together. And then um, we would get sort of some semblance of what we know as Earth today. So at least initially, Earth's um, past and as it was forming was pretty violent. And there was this term called the bombardment, and there's sort of some scientific beta debate as far as when this ended. But what happened is that asteroid after asteroid continually slammed into the Earth. And so there's a hypothesis that that is part of what delayed life from forming on Earth, because every time it did, it would kind of get wiped clean um, just because there was so much violent um, asteroids and striking the earth and so forth that, um, you know, it, it took a little while for things to calm down enough for life to actually form. Now, according to genetic data, all of life on earth is related. Okay, and we've said this before and we'll say this again, we're not touching religion with a 10-foot pole. However, um, the, reali the reality is, is the data shows that you know, bacteria and then archaea and eukaryotes all share what was called LUCA or the last universal common ancestor. And so what scientists have been wondering for a long time is where did life form? How did life form? How did you get everything together, you know, that um, is put, put things uh, together in the form that we know and love today? Okay, and where did it start? And this is definitely not an easy, um, easy question to solve. So one scientist who helped contribute to this greatly, his name was Louis Pasteur. And you might have heard of Louis Pasteur due to the process of pasteurization, okay? So I'm going to tell you a little side story just because I find it amusing. And um, my husband had relatives that grew up on a dairy farm. And so they would milk the cows, the milk would be warm, they'd bring it in, and they'd expect him to drink it as is. And he said it was the most disgusting thing he'd ever seen in his entire lifetime. Now, in addition to this, there's some controversy over drinking uh, milk that has not been pasteurized in this particular day and age because it contains a lot of bacteria that can potentially make you sick. So there was a town, and I can't remember exactly where the town was, and they insisted on being able to drink unpasteurized milk, because technically that's illegal, by the way. There's a good reason for it. <laughs> so um, this town insisted and insisted, and they fought and fought and fought legally to be able to drink unpasteurized milk. Well, finally, after like a year's worth of fighting, you know, the government was like, fine, whatever, do what you want. Go ahead and drink unpasteurized milk. Well, <laughs> this is the funny part. So um, they went ahead then and had a huge celebration and drank unpasteurized milk. And lo and behold, everybody got sick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's the evil part in me. <laughs> but um, I don't know about all of you, but I'm very thankful for the process of pasteurization because this is what allows us to drink milk today. Well, Louis Pasteur, that wasn't his only contribution to science, okay? So back in the day, believe it or not, people used to believe in what's called spontaneous generation, okay? And spontaneous generation basically means life from non-life. So Pasteur entered a contest because he was fairly certain that that was not the case. And the purpose of the contest was to show that spontaneous generation didn't exist. Pasteur was a pretty clever guy, okay? And so he designed this really great experiment that basically showed that, um, you know, life did not come from non-life. So let's think first, though, about what people thought back in the day. So believe it or not, we, you know, we take this knowledge for granted of how things work today, but back in the day, people actually used to think that um, rotten wheat thrown in a barrel 
and soiled clothing um, would spontaneously cause mice to generate. Okay, so let's think about that. No. <laughs> okay, the mice were in the barn, they wanted a free meal, they had this barrel of wheat, that's what they were going after. People also used to think, for example, that maggots would spontaneously generate from rotten meat. Well, ew, okay, I know it's gross, um, but the reality was is that's not the way things work either. So what Pastor did was he conducted an experiment, and I'm actually going to show, put a link in the announcements, and I'd like you to check out the link, okay, that describes the experiment. And what he showed was that bacteria that w would cause uh, broth to go bad actually came from the air and didn't just spontaneously generate. Okay, so again, I'll post a link um, for that in class. So if life didn't spontaneously generate, then where in the world did it actually come from? How did it start? And this is what scientists wondered for a very, very long time. And so, you know, where did life begin? How did it begin? How did all these things come together? And, you know, all sorts of other good questions. And, okay, I'm sorry, Spock is cool. I'm showing my age, <laughs> okay? But still, it's Spock. And, you know, I, I personally think he's timeless, but, you know, maybe that's just me. One hypothesis that was actually proposed by Darwin himself was that life began in a warm little pond. And remember, it's tough to actually discover this because, once again, it's not like you're going to see a, you know, fossil with a sign on it saying life began here, okay, and then being able to piece everything together. However, that is one possible hypothesis. So two different scientists independently came up with a hypothesis that suggested that life began from a series of chemical reactions, okay? And so O'Paren was one, 18, he lived 1894 to 1980, and Haldane was the other, and I'm sorry the numbers are messed up, he lived from 1892 to 1964. Okay, you don't have to know the dates of that, but I do expect you to know O'Paren and Haldane because the whole idea that life came from a series of chemical reactions actually seems to be well supported and, um, you know, potentially explains how life began. So in order for life to have, be, you know, begun from a series of chemical reactions, there have to have had a certain number of events that happened in order, okay? So first of all, you had to have the synthesis of small organic molecules. These are known as monomers. Because remember, we're talking about chemicals kind of floating around. Monomers, by the way, are the building blocks of life. And so we're talking the amino acids. We're talking the nucleic acids. You know, we're talking the, the single um, smallest chemicals that come together that ultimately form us. So that has to happen first. Secondly, you had to have the monomers join into polymers. So mono means one, poly means many. So for example, you have many amino acids come together to form proteins. You have many of the base pairs like the A's, T's, G's, and C's that come together to form DNA or the nucleic acids. Okay, so that had to happen second. By the way, all this stuff has to happen continually, but in order to get life going you know, at all, this had to happen. The third thing you have to have was the aggregation of those molecules into droplets. Because think of what a cell is. A cell is a little droplet with a whole bunch of cool stuff inside. And last but not least, you had to have these you know, instructions for these cells to get passed on from one generation to the next, because otherwise, basically, you're starting at square one every single time, and that's never going to work, OK? Now, what we're going to do, if this sounds a little abstract, it's totally fine, because what we're going to do is break this down and talk about each one of these individually, OK? so. The first thing we'll discuss is what the physical environment was like when Earth evolved, when life came about, okay? We'll talk about the early environment, and then we're going to go through and talk about one, two, three, and 4. So if it's fuzzy, just hang on. I promise by the end of the lecture, it'll make a lot more sense. So as far as what Earth was like, okay, the physical environment, you kind of need to know this because it tells you what type of reactions could take place and what could occur, okay? And then what the end products could be. So you really got to understand this before you can even get to... Um, one, two, three, and four. So let's talk about the environment as it's hypothesized. So what we do know is life has changed dramatically on Earth. Okay, so critters have altered the composition of the atmosphere, they've affected the types of concentrations of minerals and ions in the oceans, and they've even worked on the soil. Okay, so also we have a high level of oxygen, which we're very thankful for that, by the way. Okay, so um, I don't know if any of you have ever gone to super high elevation before. I've gone to relatively high elevation. I can tell you I had a heck of a time breathing. 
it's because the concentration of oxygen at higher elevation is pretty is you know lower relative to sea level and so um, you know high levels of oxygen pretty big fan of that okay and so we can thank our photosynthetic friends for that so there's two places we can kind of get information as far as what Earth's early environment was like the first, of course, rocks buried deep in the Earth, okay, at least what's left of them. And then the second, the four inner planets. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and our Moon were all formed from similar materials basically the same way, okay, as Earth was. So this can give us an idea of what the environment was like. So I mentioned earlier that the Big Bang happened about 13 billion years ago, and that's when sort of everything was formed, okay? And then our solar system formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Basically, there was a swirling cloud of gases and dust, and they began to contract, and gravity began to kick in, and the next thing you know, you got a whole bunch of, you know, particles stuck together that kind of form, you know, a, an early resemblance of Earth. We also mentioned that there was a time period where there was the bombardment, where um, the temperature of early Earth was really high, the composition of the atmosphere was not so great, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, some biogenic elements were delivered to Earth, Now I'm not talking about ET, but realistically some chemicals and some um, early elements were delivered to Earth from outer space, okay? Now, we also said that there's potential delay in the origin of life due to high energy release during planet formation. So every time the planet got hammered by a meteor, okay, that would kind of set things back. And I'm hoping you can understand the lecture because apparently the killer mailman has arrived and dogs are barking in the background. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So I mentioned recently how much I miss seeing you all in person as well as how much I miss my office. Anyway, <laughs> so, um, you know, our solar system formed, Earth formed. Um, Earth seems to be unique, though, when it comes to life. And so Mercury and the moon, they were small and they cooled really quickly. And the next slide, by the way, writes this out, so don't panic. Mars is smaller than the Earth, um, it cooled as well. So the problem is, is if you don't have any volcanic activity, you don't have an atmosphere. Okay, so now Venus um, is exposed to a large amount of radiation, so technically it's too hot. So of everything we said, you know, Earth is the one that managed to sustain life as that we know of and as we know it. So this is just what I mentioned earlier. I don't want to be redundant, but on the other hand, I want to make sure you guys get all the information you need. So. Mercury and the moon, small and cooled quickly. Mars, smaller than the Earth, also cooled. When you don't have volcanic activity, you don't have an atmosphere, and that's a big problem. Venus is too hot. So I don't know if you guys remember that little, little bitty tiny crust on the surface, you know, two miles of its thickest. Well, by 4.4 billion years, the surface had cooled. Um, the crust had formed. Liquid water had accumulated and started forming oceans and basically start absorbing CO2 and prevent greenhouse effects, okay? Now, you couple that with volcanoes, UV radiation, and lightning, believe it or not, this kind of gave everything that we need uh, for the chemicals of life, and we'll talk about how in a couple minutes. So we know that the atmosphere of the Earth was what was called a reducing atmosphere at first, and so I want you to think back to the chemistry classes that you guys might have taken previously or avoided altogether. Um, <laughs> every time I mention this, I swear I see panic looked in everybody's faces. Um, however, relax. This will be the easy version. Okay, so reducing simply means that the elements are in their simplest form. So, for example, carbon is bound with hydrogen. Nitrogen is bound with hydrogen. You know, sulfur is bound with hydrogen, and oxygen is bound with hydrogen, okay? They're reduced to their simplest form. That's what this means. And so we have methane and ammonia and hydrogen sulfide and water in the atmosphere, but really that's about it, okay? So, um, you know, again, I used to get terrified when it came to chemistry, but I promise it's not all that bad. <laughs> so what contributed to gases in the atmosphere were volcanoes, and we mentioned this a little bit earlier, and um, other gases that came from vents through the Earth's crust. In order to have an atmosphere, you've got to have volcanic activity. As scary as it is, it's necessary. So now let's get into how the, um, that list of four, okay, and how the chemical evolution of life actually happened. So we said this before, the first thing you have to have it are those monomers that come together. And remember, mono means one, so it's the simplest form. So that would be like the base pairs of DNA, or that would be the amino acids of proteins, okay? So mono meaning one. So what's so important about these, by the way, is that they're basically the building blocks of life, okay? So amino acids, nucleotides, sugars, all sorts of other good stuff. 
And what scientists wanted to know was if you have all the components of early Earth, would the monomers form? Okay, and to address this, there was actually a pretty ingenious experiment that was conducted back in the 1950s um, by a man named Stanley Miller. Write that down. His assistant last name was Uri, U-R-E-Y, I believe. Um, however, they came together and they came up with this really cool experiment. I'll talk about it in the next slide. So, Stanley Miller basically took all of the elements of what were hypothesized to be at early Earth. Okay, so he took the ammonia, and he took the um, methane, and he took all the other good stuff and put them in this closed system. Okay, it was basically a closed gas system. Well, what do I mean by gas? It was cl a closed system. He put the gases in there, okay, and I'm going to show you another diagram on the next page that will help it make a lot more sense. But we know also that there was water as we mentioned, okay, and we also know that there was lightning, all right? So he put all of these elements in this closed apparatus and let it cycle for two weeks, okay? And I got to tell you, it was actually a really brilliant experiment. I always thought it was really cool how we thought about this. Um, and so let's go to the next slide, and I can actually show you a much better diagram. This is just a staged photo. <laughs> Every time I see these, you guys know I'm cynical. I kind of roll my eyes, whatever. That's what they had to do for the press back in the day. So in the system, he had water, and that was supposed to simu simulate the, the early ocean, okay? He had methane, ammonia, hydrogen. This was going to emulate the reducing atmosphere. He also included sparks. That was supposed to be for lightning. And then he had a condenser, okay? And the whole purpose of the condenser was whatever formed in a gaseous form, um, he would be able to collect then and sample what it was. And so the cool part about this is he was actually able to synthesize amino acids and nucleotides and all the cool stuff that, you know, we think of when we think of, um, uh, you know, the beginnings of life. And the other really cool thing about this, by the way, is he did this in two weeks. Two weeks, guys. I never have experiments go that long. Two weeks. Usually it takes me that long and then something blows up in my face. But um, the, he was, you know, this was a pretty brilliant experiment and it definitely gave scientists an idea of how those early monomers formed, which is awesome. Okay, so we conducted these experiments and they ran them and re-ran them and re-ran them and the results are so awesome. They actually, they're called the primordial soup experiments, by the way. Ha ha ha, Campbell's, sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> it's so awesome because he was actually able to get all 20 amino acids. How cool is that? They got lipids, they got sugars, they got bases for DNA and RNA, they even got ATP. Okay, so the earliest building blocks of life were able to, you know, they were able to get with these simple little two-week experiments. Now think about what happened in, you know, early Earth for billions of years. I mean, that's so awesome. Now, if you guys will recall, we mentioned the characteristics of life. So they're possessing certain traits like that showing organization, metabolism, homeostasis, growth, multiplica multiplication, heredity, and ability to evolve by natural selection. Know this, by the way. Okay, so we talked about the characteristics of life earlier. You definitely want to know this as well um, if we don't, if you didn't have all these earlier. So we're starting to get to that point. Okay, well, we're, at least we have the building blocks. Okay, and so um, as we keep going, we'll talk more and more how the other parts came together as well. Now, scientists are always overly harsh um, when it comes to one another, and whenever a study is published, there's going to be someone who's going to be checking it. And believe it or not, that's actually a good thing because it's what keeps us honest, all right? So some problems with the miller urea experiment, um, and, you know, again, you just have to realize that nothing's perfect. Certain organic building blocks like fatty acids, they're produced at low yields, okay? So we don't have high concentrations of the stuff that we have in life now. The amino acids are asymmetrical. There's a right and left form, and so the wrong form tended to, you know, to be bound together in Miller's experiment. And that um, additionally, to make a protein, you have to have amino acids attached through what's called a dehydration reaction, and that can be difficult to happen. But my response to this is, you know, two, two weeks, <laughs> okay? In two weeks, you could synthesize, you know, the major... Um, elements of life and that to me is still pretty cool. So the next question is where did these monomers, you know, where were they made? Where did the synthesis happen? And I told you that Darwin suggested maybe a warm little pond. Um, others have suggested that maybe they happened in outer space and then those monomers were delivered to Earth in the form of meteorites. 
Now, again, I'm not talking ET or extraterrestrials or anything like that. Let's face it, the way our planet is going, they're going to stay away for a while. <laughs> Can we really blame them? Anyway, <laughs> um, also potentially could happen at ocean vents because there's a lot of heat and a lot of energy that happens there. So finding an answer to this, again, is going to be really, really tough because what in the world do you look for in the fossil record? Okay, so this debate is going to be going on for quite a while. All right, so let's go to step two. You've got these monomers. We know that they can be made in a lab. Okay, now we have to put them together into polymers, so into things like proteins and nucleic acids and all sorts of other good stuff. Okay, so we know our simple molecules are present, and it would basically they existed in an organic soup. Okay, now you got to put them together to be short polymers. So it has to be a spontaneous interaction, okay, which means you need energy. Well, lightning could give that. Heat from the bottom of the oceans could give that. Sun's radiation could give that. Any of those could provide the energy that you would need to put together your polymers. Okay, so we have our amino acids, and they have to come together to form a protein. Okay, and the way this works, um, you, you don't have to memorize this, of course, and I'm not... I mean, I might ask you about the structure of proteins. In fact, I probably will, but I'll make sure you've got it down cold before it gets to that point. So a single amino acid looks like the alanine, okay, or the glycine, or the isoleucine. And no, you don't have to memorize it, so if you didn't like chemistry, don't panic, okay? If it's any consolation, chemistry gave me a lot of gray hair throughout college, too, so right there with you. Now, the way these get put together, though, to form a protein is kind of like pearls on a necklace. That's the way I want you to think about it. So alanine gets put on this strand, and then glycine gets put on the strand, and isoleucine, and it basically looks like the bottom left figure. That is the primary structure of a protein. Write that down. Primary structure of a protein is when your amino acids get put in order like pearls on a necklace. Then what happens is it starts to twist, and it starts to coil. Okay, doesn't coil a ton, but it coils a little bit. That's known as the secondary structure of a protein and is shown in the middle. Coils a little bit, not too much. Now, the tertiary structure of a protein, by the way, is when it coils even more, so much so that it coils back on itself. Okay, but it's still not a functioning protein yet. You have to have what's called quaternary structure, and that's when you get several of those tertiary structures put together um, and attached to one another. Okay, so that's the quaternary structure. And again, I have a much better way to demonstrate this in class, but since I'm technologically inept and Kaltura just about killed me last semester, I doubt I'm going to be able to get it to work. So I will find a good resource for you online and make sure you understand um, proteins as well. And I apologize. I wish I was more technologically advanced. Um, but anyway, so this is what I want you to know about, you know, the proteins coming together. Now, the reason it's so important that we know about proteins is that they're a huge structural component in us, in life. Okay, so they serve as the structural components of cells and tissue and growth and repair and enzymes. They can act as enzymes. Enzymes basically catalyze all living chemical reactions. Okay, now my perfect funny example of an enzyme is my husband, to be honest. And so what my husband does um, every once in a while when I tell him if he keeps doing this, we need to have a talk about his what he's spending his time on. But what he loves to do is get onto Facebook, post something that he... Now, he's got friends that are, you know, super liberal and super conservative. My husband's just all around friends with a lot of people with different political views. And that's great. But what he loves to do is he posts something that he knows is going to get someone, you know, starting. And then someone else is going to come in, chime in, and someone else is going to chime in. And so I don't think that's called trolling necessarily because he's not vicious and he doesn't get involved. He just sits back and watches. Now, this is why we have conversations about what he spends his time during the day. <laughs> but what an enzyme does is very similar in the sense it catalyzes a reaction without getting used up or involved. Okay, so think of my husband as the enzyme. He's catalyzed starting a reaction, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't get involved. He just posts something that he knows is going to poke someone or poke someone else and Oh, yeah, I need to get him out more. <laughs> all right, now we have to have all these abiotic components getting aggregated into droplets, okay? And so basically, you've got these, these things floating around. You have to get them in, sort of, in some sort of droplet and surrounded by a membrane because that's what a cell is, okay? So, and we're going to go on the next slide, talk about what a membrane is and potentially how it could have formed from an evolutionary perspective. So think back to the biology that you guys tried to forget a long time ago, okay? And so think back to the outline of a cell, the membrane. And think back to the term phospholipid bilayer, 
Okay, so the membrane consists of what's called a phospholipid bilayer. So what I want you to get from this, though, is that it's basically constructed of um, the little bead-like looking critters with two tails hanging off of it, and there's two layers of them. Okay, so one part of them is the polar head, and that loves water. It's hydrophilic. Hydrophilic loves water. Hydro means water, philic means love, okay? The part on the inside, the fats, are tucked on the inside, and that's hydrophobic, okay? So phobic means hating, so it's water hating, okay? And so if you think about it and think about, like, even Italian dressing, okay, it's got water in it, it's got oil in it. In order to actually use it, you got to mix it all up. Well, once you do, things form in kind of a bead, especially the oils, because it's trying to get away from the water. And that's similar to here and similar to what's going on in a cellular membrane. Okay, so flip to the next slide, and I'll show you a more detailed one, and it should make more sense. So the membranes that we know and love today are, look very much like the um, figure at the top. Okay, realizing that membranes are much more complicated than just the bilayer. They've got proteins um, going in and out of them. They have all sorts of things that are, you know, basically help the membranes function. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, well, how in the world did a membrane initially form? And I would say, aha, that is an excellent question. The term for that is a thermodynamic model. And it's going to be on the next slide. Okay. So let me describe the model first, and then we'll talk about the problems with the model. Because again, you know, no one has been back there in time, and there's no fossil evidence, so this is hard to find, you know, a conclusive uh, decision on. However, um, the hypothesis is that there were increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing temperatures, and so areas would dry out, and then they would um, become moist again and dry out and become moist again, and then eventually you have these you know, elements, hydrophilic and hydrophobic that are, you know, dry. think of like the ocean, okay, and so high tide and low tide and high tide and low tide, and that over time you might have these chemicals coming together that normally might not come together because they're getting dried out. That's called the thermodynamic model, and it's not perfect, okay. Um, I can tell you, though, that, that just knowing science, because um, I've been in it for a bazillion years, <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, membranes will actually flip inside out, okay, if you do what's called heat shocking them. And so I can actually see, you know, elements of cells getting put into um, inside of, you know, a bead of some sort, just based on the fact we know membranes will flip inside out and then outside in again. Um, you know, once you have drastic temperature changes. So really, it's not that unrealistic. Now again, scientists are always critical of one another, and that's fine. So one of the criticisms was, well, where did the fatty acids come from? These, by the way, happen to be, um, you know, uh, critique with regards to cell formation. They're not readily produced by the Miller experiments, okay? So that's one, pos one problem. How are critical substances transported, transported across the membranes initially? Okay, they don't really know how to address that. Um, how in the world did cells divide early on? So these are all things that researchers have to continue to study because of the fact they don't know the answers. So the next question, of course, is where did this actually happen? Okay, and so one hypothesis is that it happened on um, down at the bottom of the ocean. This happened by uh, a scientist with the name of Gunter. It involved iron and sulfur. He suggests that metabolism came first. Again, these are just suggestions, and um, his suggestion was, though, that everything got together on these clay particles of fool's gold. Okay, so, or pyrites, iron pyrites. And, you know, that's one possibility, but the thing that scientists are trying to address, and he was in particular, is you have this huge, vast ocean. How in the world are you going to get these things coming together to actually form life? Okay, so where in the world is that going to happen? Well, technically, if you have a surface that's charged, okay, it could potentially attract all the reactants to one spot, and maybe that was where it happened. Again, just a hypothesis. Not perfect, but hopefully it makes sense. All right, last but not least, we have the origin of heredity. Okay, so um, how did cells start passing on information from one generation to the next? Okay, so I want you to title this slide in your notes, and I want you to write the central dogma of DNA. Okay, and basically what this says, we're going to walk through it together. So DNA can be replicated to make more DNA. That's what that first loop comes around as. Well, DNA also goes through the process of transcription to make RNA, okay? Then RNA goes through the process of translation to make proteins. 
Now, before you have horrible flashbacks to bio or cellular biology long ago, um, this is as much in depth as I'm somewhat going to get with this, okay? But the question is, is how in the world did this evolve? Like, how did this happen? Where did it happen? You know, again, we're trying to piece together how life as we know it came about, and this is very much a part of all of life as we know it. Okay, so we know that DNA and RNA are the methods by which um, heredity is passed on, okay? And so we also know that this is what they happen to look like if you're to draw a diagram of them. So, but the question is, do you know the story behind how this was discovered? I'm telling you, I've got to write and come up with that class of the scandals in science because scientists are human like everybody else and holy cow, this, sto this story is a doozy. So Watson and Crick are the ones who were famous for discovering the structure of DNA. Okay, it was the 1950s, and so women were not exactly treated super well back in the day. Um, I can tell you my grandmother was an eye doctor, and that woman was tough as nails. You did not mess with her, okay? Um, and so women had to be to get along and to be successful in, you know, an academic type of setting. And so Rosalind Franklin was a woman that worked down the hall from Watson and Crick, and apparently they thought of her as being a little bit prickly. And as I said, she probably had to be, okay? Well, she worked on what was known as X-ray crystallography, and that was this looking at the structure of DNA, which was not really the same thing that Watson and Crick were trying to do, but what she was doing was using um, X-rays to try and understand how DNA functioned and so forth, and they were trying to put together a model of DNA, okay? Well, unbeknownst to her, one of her grad students saw one of her um, X-rays one day and realized that um, if they showed the information to Watson and Crick, it would probably be a really big, huge help to them. So they took the, the x-ray when she was not there, ran it down the hall, showed Watson and Crick, ran it back down the hall, put it back where it was, and she was none the wiser, which stinks. Okay? And the reason, because it was the final piece of information that Watson and Crick needed to, do, needed to have to understand the structure, and the fact it was a double helix um, structure of DNA, and they won a ton of awards for this. Okay? Well, they never gave her any credit. <laughs> that stinks, all right? And in fact, it never even came out until a book was written called The Double Helix, okay? And it was written, writ written by Watson, I believe. And unfortunately, um, they received so many awards, but uh, Rosalind, at the time when she was doing her research, didn't know the negative impacts of having um, x-rays, okay, and so much radiation, and ultimately she died. So by the time Watson and Crick had actually published their work and received all the awards, she was dead, and they didn't give her didn't give awards posthumously, meaning after she died. So you know, not a pretty story. It is what it is. Um, I always believe very strongly that we need to learn what has happened in history so we don't make the same mistakes again. Okay, and definitely this is a story that you guys should know, um, just because um, you know things are different now, and we're grateful for that. But anyway, structure of DNA, structure of RNA, okay, just to give you an idea of what they happen to look like. Now, another really important experiment that came about um, actually has led scientists to think that maybe RNA was the first genetic material rather than DNA, okay? So in this particular experiment, what they realized was that RNA could self-splice in and out of a strand of genetic material, which is pretty cool. Not only that, it can actually act as a catalyst, okay, think of Facebook. <laughs> So we said that, you know, proteins can act as catalysts. Well, so can RNA. It can catalyze its own reactions. And DNA, by the way, does not have the capacity to do this, at least not in this particular sense. So this has led some scientists to come up with what's called the RNA world theory. So the RNA world theory was first proposed by Wally Gilbert. And seriously, does this picture scream the 1960s and 70s or what? <laughs> But basically, it suggests that RNA was the first genetic material rather than DNA, okay? And again, finding answers to all of this is going to be really tough because what in the world do you go look for in the fossil record? However, thinking about it is really important because then maybe we can understand what to look for on other planets as we try to seek life elsewhere. So there are some interesting facts about the genetic code, and I'm sharing this with you because I actually found it fascinating. So not only do critters evolve, but it seems as if the genetic code evolves as well, okay? So when I first started reading about this, it was just fascinating to me. So the first thing to know is that the code is redundant. There's only 20 amino acids, but 64 triplet codons that each code for an amino acid. 
Okay, so 64 triplet codons and three stop codons means there's a lot of redundancy. That means overlap, which is interesting. So what this means is you can have a mutation, but the same amino acid is still coded for so the critter doesn't die. Okay, so similar codons specify similar amino acids. This is fascinating. So for valine, which is an amino acid, that gets coded for by GUU, GUC, GUA, and GUG which means you can have a mutation in that, that third codon space, okay, and you'll still get valine. Once again, that's really important because if you end up calling in the wrong amino acid, it can completely mess up your protein and kill the critter. Similar codons specify chemically similar amino acids. So awesome! So aspartic acid and glutamic acid are really similar as far as how they function, and so the codons that code for them are also very similar, okay? Additionally, amino acids are used more often in proteins are specified by a greater number of different codons. For example, leucine is the most common amino acid. Six codons code for that thing, okay? Whereas aspartic acid, only two, and it's not very common in the cells. So evolution is actually, you know, and, and how chemicals have evolved is actually recorded in the DNA sequence. How cool is that? Okay, maybe I need to get out more, but it's still, it's very cool. Okay, guys, so these are seven questions about life that you should be able to address by now. We know number one. You know number two. Number three. Okay, we've addressed all of these. Now, for number seven, by the way, and number six, I'm going to show that in the video that I'm going to link to the announcement. So you can't answer those quite yet, but you will be able to by the time you watch the video. And it really, the video is awesome. So definitely watch it and take your time and enjoy it because it really changes your perspective on how you define life. And then what in the world do you go look for on other planets as you're trying to seek what life is and do they have it?